is Ava. Welcome to Soul GPS, where we learn to take our lives back in our hands after narcissistic abuse. In this video, I wanted to address a question that was posed by Sue in a comment in a recent video that I made, and this was a video on the seven factors other than familial abuse that make us vulnerable to narcissists. And she raised a really poignant question, and I really did not want it to. I didn't want. I was going to just answer to her uh, personally, but then I thought, why don't I make a video about it and answer um, to all of you because you might find that you relate to this. I certainly do, uh, to, in some ways. Uh, I'll explain. She says that she's being targeted by narcissists, and she gets used and abused by all of them all the time. But she had a really good childhood with loving, caring, hardworking dad who supported them. But the mother was sick and she had to take care of her as a child. Could this be a reason? And the uh, short answer to that question is yes, it definitely could be a reason. Caretakers become oftentimes codependents and enablers, especially if this means being robbed off of our childhood. If we're progressing through the childhood developmental stages in a way that it gets interrupted when there's an, like a form of arrested development that occurs, then oftentimes what happens is we're never able to really grow past that point. And so when we're five, six, seven years old and we're supposed to be out there playing, having fun in a playground with other kids, being children, being imperfect, you know, doing silly things, we're made to take care of our family, of our parents, siblings, mothers, fathers, whatever, what have you. That's a problem. And what's really crazy and sick and really crazy making here is that it often gets reinforced by the adults, not just in the uh, immediate family, but also sort of around, in the circle around it, by the child, it's, it's like a form of love, love bombing, I guess, by the child being told that, oh my God, you are being so mature, you're so amazing, you are only five, but you behave like you're 11. And it's like the child thinks that that's good and that them being mature and them doing the things that you know should an 11 year old or 20 year old for that matter should be doing is okay that is not okay and that really messes up with our development and later on it will show up because there's this gaping hole in our childhood that wasn't that wasn't filled or fulfilled and then we have to make that big jump and then we're still operating it becomes kind of like a subconscious pattern we become enablers and people who need help get drawn to us like moths to a flame and for, for a period of time we're going to feel like we met the perfect partner because we get to do the thing we we do best which is to help them and they look at us going oh my god this is like the perfect partner for me because i constantly need, need help i'm basically a hot mess and they're going to take, take they're going to take care of me and then there's this beautiful in quotation marks, sweet honeymoon intense period that ensues where the chemistry is really intense. Both people feel like they just met their soulmate before, of course, the person taking doesn't stop and there's no equal um, recipro reciprocity of the giving. And the person that constantly gives, like, is gets depleted and begins to raise maybe the issue and say, well, I feel like I've been giving so much, but you haven't been giving enough or too little or nothing at all and I feel blah 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 and then that person's like well no because you know it's your fault because you know you're supposed to be doing this for me and da 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 and it's like that whole thing just gets turned around and of course here we're getting into all sorts of uh, manipulative tactics that I don't have time to get into this this video I will make a separate video about that soon but you get the idea is that it's it's a pattern that gets reinforced and we just repeat and it leads to really self-destructive very destructive and also self-destructive places so it, it it gets soft literally soft wired into identity and the reason why i say soft wired not hard wired is because we can change it there's a way to change that by taking better care of ourselves and setting firm boundaries and also understanding you know that there's been this period of oftentimes it's enmeshment that's what happened to me for instance um where you know the parent and child gets like they're, they're like one unit and there's never like the separation is never allowed like the child is not able to completely like I, to, to to identify and and become their own person 
and because that gets that that's when they get punished when they try to do things their way they get punished but then when they do things the way that the parent expects them to do they get rewarded so it's this really weird punishment reward cycle that gets set in and forms an addiction an addiction to giving and uh, there will be this very strong pull, right? Uh, again, when we meet somebody who is like uh, somebody who needs to be taken care of and meets a caretaker. And it's, a, it's an imbalanced relationship. It seems like it's whole, but it's imbalanced because one person gives too much, the other one doesn't know how to give. One is walled up and doesn't share feelings and is not intimate. The other one is really open and like has no boundaries and looks to enmesh, you know, to like completely merge with the other person. And that creates really toxic relationship. And also sometimes what can happen to a caretaker like that is that they will grow resentful. They'll grow resentful for, for being this way. And like initially it might feel good, but eventually it's going to feel really bad. So uh, that's what happened to me, for instance. You know, like I, I grew up being the person who was expected to help everyone. And I was quite good at it. You know, I was a good girl. I would get, I would get the straight A's in school. There was never a problem with me. I would actually then also get compared to my other siblings who drove my siblings nuts. And I don't blame them because, you know, then they were being, they were expected to be like me and they were more rebellious. So then they would get punished, but then they would also figure different ways, figure out different ways to like, um, you know, get their own way with a variety of other manipulative tactics, all the while I was getting the resentment from them. And then eventually I woke up and I was like, okay, enough of this stuff. And of course, when I tried to change that dynamic, it's like you have this constellation of a family, right? That is like sets in in a certain way. And then one person pulls out and the whole thing needs to reconfigure and they don't like it. They freaking hate it. So what do you do then? Well, sometimes it might mean cutting off contact with some of your family members. That's what I did, you know, or going low contact with others, not sharing to the degree that you were used to. Because again, that is going to mean that they will expect you, they will try, they will do everything and anything. It's like conscious and subconscious at the same time. You're dealing with really powerful forces, you know, trying to pull you back into that old way of being. And if you don't do it, if you don't comply, then you're in trouble. You know, it's like you do it or else. And it's really uncomfortable. And so you will not change that pattern. So unless you start to draw boundaries and you, you stop becoming the caretaker, the unbalanced caretaker, of course, it's, it's like when you're, when you enter a partnership for, for how they say it, it's for in, in sicknesses and, and in health, that's expected, but it's, it, it's supposed to come from two people, from both people, you know, like you're both supposed to take care of each other. I remember one of my relationships, I think I mentioned it in another video, when my ex, when I got sick with a bad flu, my ex was like, I'm going to stay at a hotel, you know, because I don't want to get sick from eating. It's like, oh my gosh, really? Is sickness is in health? Not really. But when he wasn't feeling well, I was there making him soups and, you know, spoon feeding him. So that was great. But when I needed help, that was not, not great. So, so just be aware of this, be aware of this pattern and, and be aware where it came from. And it's really good if you're able, if you're able to actually like nail the particular development of stage at which you were, uh, where you were, at which you were at, 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 at which you were at, <laughs> back when this happened, so that you can um, then map that to the expectation of um, what that developmental stage required you to be, so to speak, if you were to do it naturally. If you're a five-year-old, you know, you're supposed to act like a five-year-old, but you were forced to act like a 14-year-old, and so on and so forth. And another giveaway, to being able to nail that development stage is when we're suffering or when we're being abused and we're in a reactive state, we tend to re return back to that, to that stage. So for instance, when our voice may change, we might talk like a five-year-old, we might use a reduced vocabulary. You know, it's the same thing with a narcissist. I remember with my ex, what had happened was when he was raging, he was like a different person. You know, he was like, he, he sounded like a, like a completely somebody else than when he was being rational for brief, brief moments of time where he was pretending to be rational and talked to me like an adult. And then he was like always changing, like his masks were always changing. Like one moment he was like this, this really firm male, you know, who knew who was doing it, was super in control. Then the next one he was this helpless child who just like, you know, and, and then he would like rage and he would be on, oh my gosh, it was like, I never knew what, what I was dealing with. 
And so with us, it's similar in the sense that I remember it, it hurled me back to being like this little girl who's really scared. It's like, what am I doing now? You know, or talking to him in a way to want to um, have him be more of a caretaker of me. So I would then become that little girl and say like, you just hurt me. I, I really, you know, don't like how you were treating me. And this, so like my voice would change too. So it's, it's a phenomenal, it, it, it's phenomenal what happens. It's really, really interesting how it all gets like soft wired, soft coded into our bodies and into our psyches. But a um, road to recovery really comes to, comes down to really nailing that stage where it happened, be able to like, if you can work with a therapist, really understand this, that would be ideal. You know, pick up some books like Pia Melody is really great. I'm reading her book right now and she talks about this. It's called, I think, Return to Intimacy or something like that. Uh, great book. But um, to nail the developmental stage and then set boundaries and say no more. Like understand that what you were asked to do was not okay. It was likely too much. Because if it wasn't too much, if it was just a little bit and just like, you know, because sometimes we do need to help, to help out. You know, like kids are supposed to like help with the dishes and do that. But it's like to a point. Not when it's like abuse. And and that's all you end up doing. You know, and then it, like you see what happened is it's having, it's having an effect on your life. You're drawing these negative people into your life. And that's not, not okay. That's not cool. And that is most likely the cause. I think you just nailed it right there and then. And then the next step is like I like I just alluded to this uh, moment that goes boundaries, you know, saying that's it, like this is this is this is me, this is my space. I'm only going to now pay attention to what's right before me, and worked at making my life what I want it to be, and concentrate on myself and my own well-being, as opposed to always being there on call for the person who needs help because they get used to it. And I'm dealing with this right now. I'm seeing like, because I'm not catering to every whim of this person, I am, uh, you know, being punished by silent treatment, by, I don't know, a variety of manipulations. But uh, they get used to it. They want you to keep doing it. And you're going to have to say no. And not just say no, like, with your behavior or to their face. That, sorry, I can't do it. I don't have time. I'm busy, whatever but also, and especially in your own head, when you find yourself mulling over like, this person needs help and I'm supposed to be there for them and help them, realize that they have every tool, unless they're like, re you know, really um, incapable, they're really sick or so, like I'm not talking about those situations, but in most cases, and even in those situations, you might not be, have to be the only person to help them. You know, you may need professional help. You know, if it's to say a child who needs extra support or a mother who's like can't walk or something, why should you be the only person taking care of them, right? So, so the other thing you need to do is like go inside your head and say, like form this boundary and say, this is, this is not my concern. I've been, this, been, this has been my mantra recently. It's been saving my life is that the, all these invading thoughts about my family, family here, I mean here, like, everybody needs help. And I'm like, well, I need help too. Nobody asking is asking me, do you need help? Can I help you with anything? I mean, of, the, of this circle that I'm talking about, but everybody's expecting me to like do stuff. And uh, I'm like, no, it's not my concern what they're thinking. It's not my concern what they're going through. They need to learn to take care of themselves. You know, and, and imagine, I'm going to leave you with this thought. Imagine what will happen, how your life will change. If all of this energy you're putting out there and solving other people's problems, whether in reality or in your head, and if you were to take that energy and that time and put it towards yourself and developing yourself and creating the life that you want, how quickly that you would progress, what amazing things you'll be able to do. So I'll leave you with that. And I wish you all the best. I hope this, this helped, this answer helped you and helped maybe hopefully other people as well. So let me know in your comments below. If you have any other questions, you know how to find me. I wish you all the best and I will catch you in another film. Bye.